All right. Good morning. I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting for Tuesday, September 16th to order. Those present are myself, Councillor Holbrook, Councillor Donovan, as well as members of the school board and Ruth Porter, our Finance Director, and Kate Bolton. Kate Bolton, thank you very much. Um, the School Department's Finance Director, as well as the Superintendent, Ma uh, Mrs. Massingo, and Mrs. Lang. There, I got bad for 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, so the first third item on our agenda is approval of minutes. So moved. And I will second. Um, any errors or omissions? No. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. And right on to item number four, discussion on school department financials year ending June 30th, 2014. And I'm going to go ahead and just turn that right over to you guys. I'll start out by passing you a copy of what I emailed yeah. to you. Unless you folks are, I know you're in iPad land. Are you all set? I love paper. It's so much easier. I think we, <laughs> I think think we have a copy of it. It's right there on your desk. It's an, uh, because That's Colette, Colette keeps us in the line. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Same when you So, sorry for the milling about, but um, good morning. I'm Kate Bolton. I'm the finance director for the school department. And my buddy Ruth here has invited me to come to this meeting um, at, essentially at your request just to go a little bit deeper on the school side in terms of what she reported out to you as year-end financials at your last meeting. Um, Ruth and I have talked quite a bit about how best to show school financials, and we have a format uh, that comes from our audit that's kind of old. Um, the schools have had to regroup in the way that they report financials in recent years because of the referenda. Um, now that the voters are actually looking at our budget and voting on our budget and hopefully being informed on our budget, the old categories that we used to use to report financials don't really make sense anymore. So what we did was we decided to, well, we used to clump things together in buildings and departments. So you'd see Scarborough High School, for example. You'd see everything that happened at Scarborough High School. You'd have the teachers, you'd have the custodians, you'd have the uh, oil and gas. Everything was all together in one place. Now if you look at the front page of this document, you're looking at things clumped in a very different way. And I use clumped in a classic accounting <laughs> mode. Uh, what you're looking at here are the categories that the Department of Education and the legislature have decided are relevant to people's understanding of school <coughs> funding. So instead of saying, here's Scarborough High School with all its elements, you're going to have Scarborough High School spread out across all of these other things, uh, these other categories. You're going to have regular instruction in one place. You're going to have facilities in another place. You're going to have guidance and health service and technology in different places instead of all put together under one roof. Um, it's been a little bit difficult for us to start thinking in those ways, and for a long time I've given the school board and our school leaders the information in the old way and the new way. Um, but Ruth and I have kind of been talking about trying to make sure that we have one consistent way of putting those accounts together. We have over 600 expense accounts on the school side, so you can kind of parse them out in different ways and get different overshorts. Um, you can get different pictures of how things are doing. But if this is the picture that the state is going to use, the state's going to ask us to report out this way, the Department of Education is going to use this format to compare districts across the state, which is where we get some of those per pupil things that we talk about during the budget process. It makes sense for us to use the same format for our reporting internally as well as going out to the outside world. Um, and hopefully the end result will be that the voters who are 
either passing or rejecting the school budget or doing it on the basis of this information that makes sense to them. They can understand what it is that they're looking at to some degree. So um, that's kind of the reason why it's in this format. A second piece I would point out, the first page is general fund. Um, and schools, the same way that towns do, report their financials by fund. Um, that's accepted general accounting principles, I would say, uh, for governments, is that you have separate funds for separate purposes. So, for example, in the school department, you have this whole front page is what we call general fund, which is our ordinary basic operating K-12 expenditures. Adult ed is a little tag on on the bottom line there. Um, adult ed used to be considered general fund. It's now got a little fund of its own, so it can be uh, it can be separated out from the K-12, and that again is an effect of the voter referendum piece where the voters are doing K-12 public education and adult ed. Some schools have programs and some schools don't. Some towns do it differently, so they've separated that piece out. But then if you go to the second page, you'll see that we have other funds as well. Um, sorry, take that back, make that the third page. Um, the other funds are types of um, expenditures and revenues that we have to report and keep separate for various reasons. And you'll see they're, they're kind of clumped together as well, because I just love the clumps. Um, we've got grants that we get from the feds, which are passed through the state. Um, we have some local grants and trusts that we're managing. And we have the school nutrition program, which is really considered to be a standalone program, and it has its own fund as well. So I think, um, oh, and it's, uh, Ruth is handing me a note. I feel so important. It's like the, the, the anchor man, you know, where they get the little thing. I need an earpiece. Oh, and great breaking news. Um, scholarship account as well. We have a scholarship fund, um, which is a place where we can keep those funds completely separate from others. And, and the reason is that good accounting practices, you don't mingle your funds. You have a fund, for example, you take Title I. It's a grant from the feds, comes through the state. It's got very specific and very stringent reporting requirements, very specific and, and stringent use requirements, um, eligibility requirements. All those things are tied to that one specific type of money that comes through. So the, the best thing to do is to keep that in its own space. So we should think of uh, the fund structure as uh, uh, general funds could be used for whatever expense the school department decides to use it and uh, the other funds are all restricted funds and can only be used for the purposes for which they've been established. Specific purposes. I would say that's entirely correct with one caveat, which is that in the general fund, along with the, uh, the great wisdom from the state that says this is how you should think about your expenses, there's also a stricter in the statute that says that we can't uh, move money from one of these voter categories into another um, except with some, some limits and some processes. So, for example, if when you say that you could use the general fund money for whatever we see fit, yes, in the sense that we set up our budget that way and we say, you know, this is where we need to put our funds. Once the budget is passed by the voters, then you're going to have some uh, restrictions. You can't suddenly say, well, you know, I, I really said I was going to put $6 million into special ed, but I just don't really want to do that. I want to put that into my facilities instead. There are limits on the amount that we can transfer after that referendum has done. So the subcategories become somewhat locked in place? They do. They do. Um, these, uh, you, you'll see my formatting is there's a sort of a far left column and then there are little ones underneath. So student and staff support is a big category and all those other little categories add up to make it. There's more flexibility within the subcategories, um, but you cannot move more than 5% of the budget funds out of a category. Okay. So I couldn't suddenly decide that because of an earthquake at the high school that I needed to not fund special ed anymore. 
and I'm being you know dramatic no, no, deliberately, but but there are some restrictions there, and it it kind of takes me to a sidebar about the the stakeholders that we have and the folks that are kind of looking over our shoulder. We've got the requirements that come along with the funding that we get from the state and from the feds where we need to do some reporting out to those folks as well as to the local community and to our school board. So we've got quarterly financial reports that go to the school board as our local governance group. Um, we've got year-end reporting that happens locally as well. But in the interim, we also have reporting that goes out to the feds and the DOE. So for the grant funds, for example, whenever we spend money with a grant, we do a, a monthly upload, it's all electronic now, which is lovely, to a federal reporting system that says this month we spent X dollars in um, Title I. And so that next couple of weeks we'll get some money from Title I to reimburse us for that. So that's sort of a regularly built-in reporting piece. Um, there's a grant request that we make at the beginning of the year. There's a grant report that we do at the end of the year. Um, for the regular general fund education stuff, we send a report to the DOE every quarter. Again, filed electronically, sort of double check by them to make sure that we're actually kind of doing what we said we were going to do. They have our budget, they have our actuals. Um, so they're keeping an eye on us. And then we do the quarterly reports locally, of course, to the school board. And I think, as I just said, that we do a year-end report, and that's coming up at our next uh, school board meeting, not this week, but in two weeks so that there's a proper report out that's in a public meeting that says, you know, these are our year-end financials. And I, I always throw in a caution that we usually haven't had the audit completed by that time, mm -hmm. but it's an opportunity for the community to hear some of the, you know, the big questions. You know, where are the overshorts? How are we doing? What's our surplus look like? I have a question for you. And some of them, um I'm noticing in the restricted funds, you have you know, various levels of Title I and, and whatnot. Um, I'm assuming it's a, a, a mandate that we have this specific program. Title I usually has something to do with reading and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, are your, what percentage of the grants that you're receiving are reflective of the cost to, to run those programs? Um, not sure I understand. Um, do you mean, it, are we getting... Uh, what costs you to run the program? Well, when we write a grant request, taking Title I as your example, um, what we're doing is we're creating additional programming for our students mm -hmm. based on what we get from Title I. So it's kind of the flip side. If they'll say to us, we're going to send you $150,000 this year, you tell us how you're going to spend it. Okay. And one of the um, important things to know about federal grants is that usually there is a requirement not to supplant. And supplant means you can't just pay for programming that you would ordinarily have with federal money. You have to add on. So I couldn't say, well, I've got this reading teacher in the first grade, and I think you know it would be super duper to have her get paid out of Title I, and then I won't have to take it out of my general fund money. But really, I'm not supposed to do that. What I'm supposed to do is I'm supposed to have an extra teacher because Title I is designed to help kids who have um, financial difficulties catch up to the rest of the kiddos. So it's, it's extra. Okay. Towards a targeted population. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. A very specific targeted well, Title I. And uh, occasionally you can, you'll have, um, you know, collateral benefits from that where you can say, you know, we've, now we've developed this great reading program with the help of this Title I teacher. It's serving this community, but it's also going to help all our other kids because it's allowed us to become better at teaching language or what, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but when we have the grant funds, the grant funds, before they even arrive to us, are spoken for. They're, they're outlined, and um, we know what we're doing with them. Does that help? Some of them used to provide benefit um, payments also, you know, for like retirement and stuff. I'm not sure that they still do anymore, but... Uh, 
well, in addition to cost for the, the wages? Yeah, we can we can take a person. So if we take that reading teacher and we say, um, you know, <coughs> we're going to have Mrs. Smith come in and she's going to create a reading program for our first graders who are struggling, and Mrs. Smith's salary, benefits, main PERS, um, any of the costs of her as, a, as an employee can be sent to Title I and said, yep, this is our person and this is you know, how we're paying for her. Okay. Um, so the programs, it doesn't have to just be you know, buying supplies or, or curriculum or software. It can be people. Okay. And it often is. In fact, our Title I uh, funds our people, mostly. Um, and our local entitlement, which you can see is the biggest one, that's um, the IDEA, which is, we love acronyms, right? It's uh, yeah. special education, essentially, mm -hmm. funds, funds for uh, the special education department. It's obviously the biggest grant that we get, and um, that money goes in a large proportion to staff, okay. extra ed techs, um, extra specialists like we have a teacher of the deaf who's partially funded through um, local entitlement. Um, yeah, staff is definitely in there. But again, you're, you're writing your grant at the beginning of the year and you're saying, this is what we're going to do with this money, and they've told you how much you're going to get. So that number can fluctuate quite a it bit can. from year to year? It can. Um, luckily for us, it hasn't fluctuated Im immensely. Um, we're not hugely funded. Uh, with grant monies to begin with. So um, if during the, the economic downturn, the FY 9, 10, 11, we did see less coming in in federal grants. We saw less in everything. Um, but it, proportionately, it wasn't devastating to our program because, as you can see, it's a little, little tiny piece of what we're already doing. Mm -hmm. And again, it's intended to be added on to what we're already doing. So we're not taking away essential pieces if we lose that funding. I noted that we're on this uh, other funds page, so I'll ask the question. I'm, it's a little. Uh, the Feinberg Trust, it says is, uh, in the footnote, is new? Um, <coughs> Feinberg Trust, we are so grateful to Louis Feinberg and his family. Um, he was the most amazing man. The first thing that he did for us while he was living was to give us <coughs> a bequest, or it wasn't a bequest because he was alive, he gave us a gift of $100,000, um, and his intent in working with the superintendent and some other school leaders was for that to support the Scarborough Education Foundation and, it, and enabled the Scarborough Education Foundation to get up off its feet. And, and, um, and when you see that beginning balance of $80,000, we've given two $10,000 uh, payments to the Scarborough Education Foundation for the two years that that's been in business. And um, those came from the original Feinberg gift. The $150,000, which you see as year-to-date revenues, is actually a bequest. Mr. Feinberg passed away, and in his will, um, he asked his attorney to work with us to develop a way that he could uh, support enhancement of the arts in the schools. And um, we've developed a sort of a, a working group of an arts council that's working on ways that we can bring that money to life and, and do some cool things in the district with it. But again, you, know, you see segregated because it is for a specific purpose. It was given to us for now for a couple of specific purposes. But uh, we want to make sure that that money is not commingled with other funds. And I believe those have to be approved by the school board. Um, Accepted by the school board, correct? They have done, yes. And then once they're accepted, then they are restricted for what they can be used for based on what was put into the documents from right. from the folks who donate the money. What, what the intent was of the gift. Yeah, and, it, and that goes all the way down to simple little things like scholarships where you might have a you know $5,000 fund for a scholarship, but it's in honor of so-and-so, and so therefore that scholarship is going to go to a child that that family has identified as the type of recipient they're looking for, for example. No, I, and I, 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 one, I thought that was probably a very nice story, as you related nice to get it, it out, uh, yeah. about the Feinberg Trust, but also the beginning balance and the year-to-date revenues. Obviously, there was a there was a there, new new story, <laughs> a new story. You don't you don't have you know uh, income generated from an eighty thousand dollar trust. 
I uh, wish that we could. Yeah, so that, that, yeah. that would be really nice. That's the kind of financial advisor that you're looking yeah, for. That's that the one we need. I'd, I'd ah. sign up for that person. <laughs> so um, Feinberg Trust also supports uh, what got Louis Feinberg's interest was the backpack program, interestingly enough, which is pretty much self-sustaining uh, due to the generosity of the community. But he was, he was very intrigued with that, and, and that's what prompted our meeting with him. Um, and um, and uh, we ended up with a very large gift. And uh, as Kate said, the way that we structured it was to provide seed money to the um, the education uh, foundation, Scarborough Education Foundation, because it was just starting, of ten thousand dollars each year to basically guarantee that they would have seed <coughs> for at least their first eight or eight or nine years, um, even if the backpack program were to, to uh, take some of those resources. That's true, right. yeah. And we have spent uh, just a little bit to support the backpack program as well. And you're familiar with that where mm -hmm. we, I, I see you look, yeah. that's mm -hmm. great. So I get a chance to talk about that. Um, the backpack program is was started by our school nutrition director. Um, and what it does is it provides a backpack of healthy, stable foods for any student who is in need or whose family is in need to take home with them so that they're not just getting a nutritious school lunch or breakfast and lunch, which we provide for kiddos. But also, if, if there's a concern about that, the ability of that family to feed themselves over the weekend or over a long school break or over the summertime, those backpacks can fill in um, a, some serious gaps for our families. And those families are usually identified through kind of a, a network of um, folks who have their ears to the ground. Some of our school social workers, our school nurses, mm -hmm. teachers, um, also fellow members of the community who are aware that there may be a difficulty at home. Um, and that's supported by a number of, of folks. I mean, it, Tons of people donate food. Tons of people donate money around the community. And um, the Project Grace is very active in, in supporting that program. And uh, of course, we have the, the Feinbergs who are very interested as well. So that's a cool thing. It's a nice story. I'm, I'm going off on all kinds of sidebars here, <laughs> but I think it's all good stuff, right? Yes. Okay. So the middle page of this is the one where everybody does the drum roll and you know, how are we doing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and again, you see my little little notes all over. It's a draft, it's not done, it's as of. So this is, this is all kind of moving targets, but we're getting close to the end of receipts of invoices for FY14 and I'm yelling at people to get things in. I've got a couple <laughs> more revenue pieces coming in um, from a couple of different sources. Um, but the, the top chunk of this is revenue, and, and really if you look at it in, in chunks, you start with the first page which tells you at the bottom line in that green bar, how did you do overall on staying under spending? The second page says, well, how did you do overall in receiving the revenues that you expected? Um, obviously, the first two lines of our revenue table are our local funding, the taxes, and the um, prior year surplus, which we applied to this year. So we got all of that, thank you very much. And then the rest is working from the next big one down is, is state subsidy, which is our uh, general purpose aid, and then um, other miscellaneous revenues that the school is able to generate and project. So um, going again to the first page, if you say at the top, where was our surplus when we began the year? Next block in green is how did we do coming in under our budgeted expenditures? Go down to revenues on the second page and say, well, how did we do in of receiving the revenues we anticipated receiving? The little tiny block in the middle of the second page is what do we need to do with the excess money that we have that doesn't go into undesignated surplus? And that's where we'll talk about school nutrition in a minute. And then that breakdown of general fund surplus balances at the bottom kind of tells the story of where we started and where we ended in terms of our fund balance. Can you address state agency client funding? Sure. Um, state agency clients are um, sometimes old fashionedly called wards of the state. They're children who are 
um, not so much in foster care, but children who are possibly in a group home or in an environment where the state is their mom. And so for those students, if they live in our community, we're able to uh, send a bill to the state of Maine on a monthly basis, another one of our report outs, and it usually comes from our special services department. And it, it goes to the state and says, we provided these services for these students and we are able to collect reimbursement for that. Um, it's interesting that uh, I'm, I'm sure that you're looking at that's another money maker for us, right? Because <laughs> there's, there's $150,000 that more than we expected. It was the variance line rather, exactly. than, rather than the money making concept. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I can see you, you heading for $150,000 earnings on everything we do. That's, that, that's my goal too. Um, the reason that it's really hard to budget for that line in terms of what you might get in revenue is that it's based on individual kids and their eligibility and that's a very mobile population. So in some years we know that we've identified 20 kids that we can bill for, we can you know, request reimbursement for, five of them will move out or 10 more will move in or um, you know, there, there's a, it's a very volatile population. Um, and so as you can see this year I budgeted conservatively for 14 and we actually had two students move in who had very high needs and had significant services. The other thing that skewed this a little bit, and it's one of the things that drives me a little bit cuckoo because it's so complicated and it's hard to explain, but um, on state agency clients, we are now permitted to bill tuition for students who are sent out of our district, but they're residents of our district. In the past, the state paid that tuition directly. So again, we're billing but we're also paying the tuition. So there's a little bit of an offset in there. Okay. So that if you were to um, look at my year-end financials in a couple of weeks and you look at the special education tuition line, you're gonna find that that line is actually overspent. It's one of the ones that we'll be looking at with the school board um, to authorize an overage or a budget transfer. Um, so it's, it's a place where we've been able to recoup some of that, but we also have to account for it on the expenditure side. Um, other reimbursements, you've got Medicaid reimbursement, which again is a little bit iffy. Again, it's based on families and students who qualify for Medicaid and the types of services we might provide in the school department <coughs> that would be eligible for Medicaid reimbursement, which are usually on a medical model. Um, they're typically things like OT, PT, speech and language therapies. Um, so that's what that one is. Um, and I don't know if any of the other ones jumped out at you as sort of a question mark um, on no. the revenue piece. Um, the year-end transfer section, well, actually, let me, let, me, let me go back one step here. On the general fund appropriations, we've got $300,000 left in the bank, budget to actual at the end of the day. Again, pending, pending, pending. <laughs> Draft not audited. <laughs> Um, I, don't, I, I know we've talked about this quite a bit during the budget process, but I think it might be a good opportunity again to say it publicly is that school departments cannot spend more than the voters told them they could. So in that K-12 referendum piece where we've got the 39 million, we're not allowed to go over that by law. It wouldn't matter if Mr. Feinberg gave us $150,000 and said throw it in your general fund and just do whatever you want with it. It wouldn't matter if for some wonderful reason the state decided to increase our GPA or we got that extra $150,000 from um, state agency clients. No matter what we get on the revenue side, we can only spend what we've been authorized to spend by the voters, which means that if we're doing the job right, then when we get to the end of the year, we're going to have some kind of a reasonable amount left over. And this amount, I believe, equates to about uh, 1%, less than 1% of the budgeted amount. So I think it's, it's something that distinguishes us a little bit from some of the other town departments because 
um, and you know I don't want to speak to their their operations, but there there are cases where if you get a windfall in a department, you can go out and spend some money. And even though we were to get a windfall, which would be lovely, uh, we couldn't do anything but bank it. So it ends up falling into our surplus at the end of the year. So then when you do that process, you go from um, the beginning balance in that breakdown of surplus balances, you go from the beginning balance to what we saved, I guess, we came in under budget, that's FY14 appropriations balance, and right now I'm looking at that little block at the bottom of page two. Mm -hmm. The uh, 311,000 is what we didn't spend of what we were allowed to, to put it simply. Then the line under that, the FY14 revenue balance is what we received in excess of what we expected to receive in revenues. Um, so that all plays into the year-end picture, and then that middle block on page two, the year-end fund transfers. Um, you've heard us talk quite a bit during uh, school budget and town budget conversations about our school nutrition department and the fact that it's intended um, in some sort of magical sense to be self-supporting, but that it never really has been self-supporting, and so you've heard us talk about trying to put some money into the general fund budget to support that program. Um, you know, we've gone back and forth about what a great program it is, how well it's serving our students, um, how many strictures it, it operates under where, you know, you can only charge so much, but you have to spend this and you have to provide this type of food. Um, USDA re DA regulations are, are extremely stringent. So in the end, at the end of the day, you've got a shortfall in that department and it has to be funded from somewhere. It has to go back to zero. So that's where some of our undesignated surplus will go, and it will become designated, and it will go to cover the deficit in food services. So when we get to that meeting with the school board, um, October 2nd, I believe it is, I'll be asking them to do two things after I report out to them. One will be to authorize transfers to cover some of the budget lines, and there are probably about 15 of them that are over budget by more than $10,000. Um, there's a board policy that says any individual expense line that's over budget by $10,000 or more needs to be addressed directly and specifically by the school board by a vote. And what we've done with that in practice is to say, well, we'll wait until things settle down at the end of the year, and at the end of the year, we'll take those accounts that are over, and we'll talk about them, and we'll move some money to cover those. Um, luckily, in my tenure, there's never been more than 15 or 20 accounts that have run over budget individually, um, and there's always been some money to move to cover them um, in, a, in a reasonable way. Um, the other thing that we'll ask them to do on the 2nd of October is to vote to apply some of the surplus from FY14 to make whole the school nutrition department mm -hmm. so that they'll be back at a zero balance for the beginning of their year. That's, I think that's, you'll recall that we talk about reconciliations. I, I've been, I've had, I've had food service on my reconciliation list since I arrived here because historically, as Kate says, it has been underfunded and we've been trying to make that adjustment so that there's not such a big um, difference between um, how we fund it and, and basically what the cost is because we've always recognized that we have not adequately funded it. And then when push comes to shove, um, we tend to kind of put those reconciliations aside and say, well, one more year, we'll just, we'll take care of it out of surplus. And that's what we've done. And it, it well, we've made some adjustments. It, we have. We've put a little bit into the, into the general fund budget. It, it does give the accounting people a little bit of fits because you're saying, well, we're sure we're going to have enough surplus at the end of the year to take care of this. So we'll just put it over here and we won't think about it. Um, and, you know, Ruth and I get kind of, like hives when people do that, <laughs> but but it's worked and it, it's okay. Right, in the 2014 budget, uh, you had uh, uh, $200,000 from uh, the fund surplus designated for use in the 2014 budget. That's correct, and that is really just considered to be revenue to support the budget as a whole. That's not specifically for right. anything. It's, it's and, and if you had funded the... Um, uh, food services 
budget by 197,000 more, that would have merely increased the, unfund, the use of fund balance by 197,000 more. Um, well, it could have, or if we had put it into our operating or, budget, right. then it would have been on the expenditure it, side, and we would have needed offsetting revenue. Right, had it been passed. Right, right. right. So you would have had to see your revenues. You'll note that, <coughs> that in, in this beautiful, perfect world of the approved budget line, um, your general fund appropriations, which is your expenditures, is equal to your estimated revenues, which is magical. The... Um, and I, I, I can see how you got to the 464,000 as the um, uh, undesignated net surplus. Net surplus. Uh, pending an audit. Hmm? Pending an audit. Pending an audit. Pending an audit. Thank you. I, what I couldn't understand was how you went from the $500,000 budgeted uh, un, uh, fund balance use <coughs> Uh, in the budget cycle that we went through to 800,000 fund balance. In the last iteration of the budget, the one that went to the voters the second time, the revenues as well as the expenditures were adjusted by the school board. So they were, there was a reduction of expenditures and an increase of revenues to create the impact on the tax levy that the council agreed to or the, account, the so, council approved. Yeah, I guess I don't understand that. I, I remember a figure being approved by the town council for the purpose of submittal to the referendum process. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand that there was, uh, that that, as I had went back over my materials, uh, from what had been recommended by the school board finance committee was to go from 500 to 600,000. And I never saw any place where it went from 600 to 800,000. Well, I'd have to look back at the documents to see exactly when it was, but it was at that last, yeah. the last iteration um, in between the, there was a failed referendum and then there was mm -hmm. a second referendum. And at that point there was a reduction um, and, an, and a target, if you will, of what the tax increase should be. So the, the changes that were made by the school board to accommodate that and to get to that bottom line were both on the expenditure and the revenue side. Because I thought the last uh, thing that the school board did was approve the recommendation uh, of a budget from the school board's finance committee and that that then came to the town council and the town council reduced it from 3.25% tax impact to a 2.9% tax impact. Mm. I think and that so I didn't think that it ever got back into the hands of the school board for got it. further adjustment. Got it. Well, and that, that's actually, that points out a really good point. Um, we can't just take a change off the bottom line of our budget because of the whole referendum process, because of these fancy categories, we have to say where that money's coming from. So any time that the council makes a recommendation and says, you know, here's the budget you've handed to us, we'd like you to reduce it by $200,000, mm -hmm. the school board has to act and go back and parcel out that reduction into the places where they feel that the impact will be felt in right. the spending side and also in the revenue side. So. Any time that the council makes a change to the bottom line, right. then the school board's going to have to touch the... That's why I assumed piece. it was after the town council identified a referendum, a number for referendum vote. Right. <clears throat> that the school board would have acted after that to increase the fund use of fund balance monies mm. from 600000 to 800000 it would have had to be after they had the bottom line. Yeah. <coughs> I think that's part of it too is that in the, in the <coughs> just the terminology, but the, the discussion was to reduce the amount of uh, tax appropriation from three and a half to, to whatever it was. So it gives the school department the flexibility to decide whether they want to try and find some increased revenues or to reduce budget. So. 
Because that's exactly uh, what I think happened. That's exactly it what happened. It wasn't that, yeah. that <clears throat> the expenses went off the books. It was that revenue was created from the use of fund balance. It was a combination <coughs> of it was a combination of both. Okay. Yeah, yeah right. And I, I think, expect uh, it was a combination of both. I think but that so. was I think you may find that, that you would see a similar process on the town side as well. I remember that you know, in, in some of the iterations as we're going through the process, it's like, well, we've decided that we think we get a better projection on revenue. Um, excise tax or, or what have you, or we know now, we do it with, and, the, and, with the GPA. And, we, and my only concern was that by using a revenue source that is not capable of sustaining itself, mm. you create expenses that stay in the budget mm -hmm. that can't necessarily be sustained without future tax increases. Got it. That was, that was my perception of you know, using uh, another form of revenue that doesn't necessarily repeat itself year in and year out. And then the other piece on that is, um, while they've shown it this way, because when we actually do the, the audit in the financial statements, if we allocate, for example, 200000 for 2014, but they underspend, and which they didn't in this case, but if they were to overcollect, and we didn't need to use that 200,000, we would show essentially the estimated revenue of 200,000 with a zero right. because they don't really, they didn't need to use those funds. And then that gives them the opportunity to essentially reallocate them for a future period. Right, and I think you know what Ruth is saying very straightforwardly is that anything, any revenue, any non-expense that is not used is ultimately going to roll forward. But I, I see what you're saying. And yeah, I, I mean, I it's, it, if you build in an assumption of 800000 of use of fund balance, and then you go to the next year, and you say, okay, let's use 800000 of fund balance to uh, pay for the expenses that we are continuing to repeat year after year, mm -hmm. you go, oh, gee. We don't have eight hundred thousand dollars of fund balance. We're down to four hundred and sixty-four thousand dollars of mm -hmm. fund balance. So now you've built in a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar tax increase automatically. Well, they they can't really do that because they actually, based on these unaudited numbers, if they if we were to start our two thousand sixteen budget process, they couldn't use eight hundred thousand. The most they could use would be this four hundred. Exactly. So they would, you know, they've. They've made adjustments. Right, they will but have if made the expense is embedded in the, in the budget because you don't hire somebody one year and then fire them the next. Right. Uh, you you have to make up the, the difference. <laughs> that was that's my that was my concern. Right, and I, I think that I, I think that the there are a couple of things that keep us sort of on the straight and narrow as far as the use of fund balance is concerned. I think we talked about. Um, there's a state statute on the books that says that school districts can't keep more than 3% of their budget as undesignated fund balance. And I, don't, I think I mentioned this at some point in one of our surplus conversations, but that, that statute's actually been waived the past few years because I think they were worried about districts getting a bunch of federal money during the downturn and then losing the federal mm -hmm. money, so maybe it would be a good idea for them actually to have some more fund balance so they wouldn't have that cliff thing. And, um, it actually turned out to be, for us, very advantageous that those um, restrictions weren't not in place because we were able to build up our fund balance and then use it, and you know, obviously we're using it to support keeping taxes down. Um, the state statute does say that the reason, well, it doesn't really talk about reasons, but the reason why they uh, limit school surplus to 3% of the annual budget is because they don't want us stockpiling money. They don't want us hanging on to taxpayers' dollars and then having this money sit in the bank and not do anybody any good. Do you have an expectation to when that might come back into effect? I really don't. I mean, you know, the, the ways of Augusta are very mysterious. Um, my, my sense is that it was waived because the economy tanked and because they were concerned about local municipalities and districts being able to have something that will sustain them as they rebuild. Um, you know, my guess is that, it, I know it's not in place for fiscal 15, and I think fiscal 16 they may have already waived it. I'd have to take a look. I know it was, there was it was <coughs> going forward when I was looking at it in this budget process. Um, but the, the fact is, I mean, it, it, it is really a best practice for schools not to hang on to a lot of money. 
Um, right now, the 464 or four, around 450,000 by the time we get to the end of the day is, is going to represent about 1.2% of our budget for the year, um, which is it's okay with me. I don't need to see 3% in there, um, knowing that. It's about 1.1 million. 3%. Thank you. Almost Ruth. 1. Yeah, I was trying to run that. Thank you, Ruth. 1.3 million. Thank you. 1.2 million, sorry. 1. Would be 3%. Right. At least uh, part of the thinking, I think, that went into uh, the debate the town council had was to provide level services funding mm -hmm. so as not to uh, do harm to the school's programs. Uh, uh, and we were, tr at least some of us were trying to work off what, what that number might look like. And you can never be exactly right, but we were trying to approximate it. Uh, uh, the fund balance use raised the question in my mind, have you built into your budget for 2015 uh, something that goes beyond the fund, the, the level services budget? Because there was a scope of programmatic mm -hmm. expenses and uh, uh, salary payments and whatnot, and there were a whole series of things that had been suggested to be done if if you went beyond the level services budget right, in which terms were of the hiring staff new and other programs. And restorations. Did, yeah. did the, has the school board adopted uh, any of that so that the... We, the did, we did retain about half of the final um, group of new proposals and restorations. So there are some part-time new positions in there. Can you just give me, remind us, I remember it was like, was it like 10.5 FTEs? I think the last iteration was somewhere around 10.5. 20 people, 10 .5 but, but about 10.5. Exactly, yeah. and I think we landed at somewhere around 7, but I can get that information. Some of which, oh, yeah. okay, so, because I just don't think that is understood by people. Oh, there. there were some there investments. There were absolutely around special some, some investments special made in terms of special things. services, which are were required to make, yes. mm -hmm. and some new investments um, in terms of uh, um, the foreign language uh, restoration of the foreign language program, uh, which had been uh, decimated uh, back a number of years ago. Um, and restoration of um, a piece of art and a piece of music, again decimated um, in 09-10. Um, I, I think, um, and, and maybe a little bit of um, enrichment opportunity in terms of uh, the high school, but it was, it was very, very minimal in terms of the new investments. I can get you the, the list so you can see. One of the things to think about um, when, Thank you. when it comes to budgeting going forward, um, and you know, we talk about the variances and what the, um, the base expenditures are and the inherent costs and so forth. One of the things that makes us sort of a, a tough <coughs> moving target is the amount of staff that we have and the amount of turnover that we have. Um, you know, particularly, I think when you're comparing to some of the town departments, where you have you know great longevity, you have people who've been there for years and years and years, and you don't have a huge amount of turnover in your regular staff. In the school department, it's a much more mobile population. This year, since the budget was passed for FY15, and now we're actually starting FY15, we're starting the school year. There were 38 people who left, either retired, resigned, you know, moved on for whatever reason. There's going to be another 12 or 15 or so in an average year that leave in the middle of the year. So the people that I built the budget for back in December, January of 2014, 13-14, a big chunk of them are gone, which means that we have this sort of uh, turnover variance that happens in, in uh, the salary and benefit lines. Um, in the very quick and not very great calculations I've done um, for the people who have come in to replace the teaching staff and the professional staff. We're actually going to be a little bit under budget, which is great. Um, you know, maybe to the tune of 100 grand, which would be terrific. Um, but it does make things really complicated. It makes it hard for a person to look year to year, um, especially in an account where you've only got a handful of people. Like, you know, there's a line for the one librarian at the one K2 school, and oh wait, she retired and somebody else came in. 
and that one's got family benefits, but this one didn't, and you see these huge variances in the individual lines, um, but they're not necessarily reflective of an increase in the budget. It's a, it's a change in a, in a person. Um, so that it, it can make things look a little peculiar, but I guess what I'm going to here is that even though we've added additional positions, we're still obligated and we're still working to come in under that budgeted amount so mm -hmm. that we're, you know, we're not asking for more than what we can afford to bring forward. What I was listening for was uh, were the expenses that went beyond the level services budget um, relatively permanent in nature as opposed to uh, uh, a one-time if we're talking so If we're talking about staff, yes. But I would also say that those were probably paid for, in a sense, by the turnover of staff as well, so that we wouldn't be moving forward with a much larger inflated staff cost than we would have had had everything stayed status quo. Does that make sense? If I, if I start with these people and they cost $500,000 and then a bunch of them retire, so now they cost $400,000, but we've hired some new people for $100,000. Generally, you get to hire for less than yeah. somebody that's retiring right. at a tenured price. Yeah. All right, so we're, we're still maintaining that same cost level to a certain extent. Yeah, I guess I, what I see is that there won't be a revenue source next year to match the mm. uh, uh, permanent expenses that are built into the budget. Correct. On the other hand, you've got offsetting reductions in your personnel costs that will right. presumably... Yeah, it's not a static situation. Correct. So, so that's the point that I'm going to, is that you, you have that movement so that right. even though you may have added people, you may have added them yeah. at a lower cost. Right, and, so. and that's really a 2016 budget discussion. You won't Correct. know that until next spring. And right. The okay. other thing is that there have been, there have been changes in terms of um, benefits. And, um, oh, and some uh, systemic changes that were um, uh, that were implemented in terms of the new employment contracts that carry w with those changes um, some opportunities for some good savings. Oh, good. Nice. And I think we talked about. Nice that. to hear. I know you had talked about long-term efforts to to move some things in the right direction from a economy and value point of view. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and the thing that's, that's really great is that the, the big negotiation that happened this past year was with our teachers group, and that's obviously our largest group, our professional group, um, the biggest bargaining unit, and the most impactful on the budget. And um, the teachers union was very understanding and respectful of, of, of our difficulties with funding, our difficulties with the increased cost of benefits, um, and they were very willing to negotiate some changes in their benefit package. You know, obviously nobody wants to have uh, more costly or less valuable benefits in their job, but they definitely went in that direction and um, made some significant efforts to save us some money. So, so um, just a couple quick things I wanted to make sure we um, kind of wrap up to because we still have to get to some other things. <laughs> so you don't want to uh, have me so I, 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 I did have um, just two quick things, and then we'll take a moment just for if there's any public comment, and then, um, again, if you have any questions of us that we can answer as well. Uh, I, I did have two quick questions. Um, one is a question, one more is just a thought-provoking statement that you can get back to me because I don't expect you to be able to rattle that off on the top of your head. Um, I just want to go back for some clarification um, on the food services. So. Um, historically, and, and I'm just remembering in my own mind, and I want to make sure I have this right, we know that it's always underfunded, but we also always know that there is money at the end and that you move funds within an intertransfer somehow to cover that cost, and that's historically how that's happened. Um, so it's not necessarily that you predict at the beginning of the year how much fund balance it's at the end of the year, when you have all your receipts and payables, you say we have this here left in this area and we transfer things around accordingly. Um, how long has that activity been happening, I guess is my question. How long has school lunch needed that support? Um, and, well, on top of that, though, it's a, d a double question because there's always some kind of fund left that you've transferred to it. So historically, you're within the right amount of money within your total budget, by the sounds of it, 
but it how it has to get moved around and finagled at the end. So I'm wondering if, if it's a matter of putting a new budget line in or a matter of maybe just as a whole encompassing it better. Well, it is a matter of putting a new budget line in, and that's what George was talking about earlier with the reconciliations. What we really should be doing in a perfect world is we have a line in our general fund operating budget that says school nutrition support. We do have a line now. We've had it for two years. Um, it started at 50000 and it's increased to seventy five. and uh, last year's budget is still seventy five in this year's as well, I believe. And the, the really... Uh, correct thing to do from a fiscal responsibility perspective would be to say we're pretty sure we're going to need 200 grand or we're pretty sure that you know the last last year we needed 150 there before that we needed 90 the year before that um, you know so those costs have continued to we we uh, really uh, grocery store continues to increase, so I'd assume the food well, program. Yeah, continues. I mean, I could give you a whole nother lecture about the crazy USDA regulations and how much money we're spending on food. I mean, the, the but it sounds like to me it's being spent no matter what within that Correct. budget year. Correct. It's being Correct. spent no matter it how you slice it or look at it. It cannot so go to the red. From but from an accounting standpoint, the, the technically really proper way to do it is to say this is what we think we're going to spend. Pick a number, million five. We think we're only going to receive a million four, so we're going to be short about a hundred thousand, and that should be technically an appropriation. It should be in it the budget. It should be showing us essentially just like we have a net budget for the school, which is uh, property taxes. There should be a net budget in food services, which is essentially property taxes. So essentially, what they're doing is they're saying of the property taxes we're going to collect, we're going to take seventy-five thousand of it and give it to the school. So to me. In my mind, it should be total revenues less appropriations. The deficit should be property taxes, essentially. But uh, they do it all as part of their general fund budget as opposed to allocating those pieces out. And you're right. It could go either way. It could be funded directly into school nutrition, which some places do, some districts do, or it could be funded as a general fund transfer. support for with transfer. My, I guess if I could... I don't know if that's a motion, but <laughs> but my 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 preference, I guess, if I might be able to say it that way, is it's being spent no matter how you slice it. You are not taking anything. It's within a year. You already know you're going to pull it from whatever you didn't spend to fill that gap hole. It might as well have at least some accountability to pluck out and, and be able to look at it. It would add transparency. Right. So when we um, get to that point in our budget where we're it's paring not things a new down, Dollar it amount, won't be a pared down thing. It will be something that stays there. But I mean, historically, something somewhere is obviously somewhat under budget, and something is somewhat over budget. And you're all just, like I said, playing numbers at the end. That that seems a little ridiculous to me. So, and we've been working on that actually yeah. on the town side because there are some utilities that we have typically been underfunding. Every year we budget an amount and we always spend more, but and there's not a lot we can do with utilities is what they are. Mm. And so over the years what we've been trying to do is to bring those utility budgets so that they're more reflective of what we're actually what their spending. Actual cost and I think is. that's kind of well, what we need to yeah, do. Yeah, and, and I think you know we do that on a smaller scale with every line that right. we have. When we're right. doing a budget review, we're looking at well you know, I did it with substitute lines for 100 years, it felt like, where incrementally we would increase them year after year after year until they were finally reflective of what we're really spending. And this year, for the first time, hallelujah, I don't have to do a budget transfer at the end of the year for substitutes. That's amazing. Like, it's a miracle. Well, I do have one for nurses. But Sorry. <laughs> um, I have one last thing um, I just wanted to maybe touch on a little bit. What at this point do we actually receive as in dollar amount? What's the dollar amount that we get from state revenue? And how does that come with whatever? We get a GPA. We talk about some of the volatility over the last few years about Scarpa being losers and, and that sort of thing. My, my question, and, and which is I'll, I'll tell you my thought process mm. here is, what point are we left with how much we're getting from them? And is it worth, to me, is it worth even worrying about it anymore mm. and maybe just self-funding the budget? 
Yeah. Um, I, it's I, funny because Bob Mitchell used to say he wanted to secede from the state of Maine because they were nothing but trouble and <laughs> we just do it ourselves. I, yeah. If I, um, I so you're talking about GPA, but are you also, GPA is the, the school subsidy specifically for the K-12 operations. Are you talking also about things like the Medicaid or state agency clients? Or things I think like I'm that more specific to the, 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 GPA, the school yeah, subsidy. Because it, that's the volatile number. That That's the thing that's created. I remember one year we had a $3 million hole. Um, without even trying, mm. so my well, and it my has been those revenues going away over the past five years that has really put us in this place. I think, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember, we're only at a point that it's. I know it's on say only. It's a lot of money. Well, but it's five and a half million or so this year. Five million. But I know we come to a point we lose it in the millions as we're losing it, and and I'm wondering, um, and I've said this, you know, one of my first years on council, should we be looking at? self-funding and working towards that goal and if the state happens to swing some money our way great mm. you know that that's that's fantastic but um, having a very more proactive approach to how we're going to finance the school department and fund it versus a reactive approach um, especially when you're looking at improvement plans and, and those sorts of things uh, if, if you're already out of the gates looking at a million dollar hole that, that that isn't conducive to an improvement plan. Um, so, you know, maybe some strategies around a goal of, well, if we did want to pursue this avenue, this is how we would implement it. Well, and, and what you lose then is you lose that volatility and that wave of, you know, oh, we can invest this year, but we can't next year. and and. You, and you're again, able to very have non-conducive to <laughs> anything. Yeah, well, you can see, you can see yeah. it in the student data. You yeah. can, I can see it going back in the student data of the in, the invest and the sort of uh, deconstruct, um, and it's and it's followed basically what's happened. And more recently, the, what we're trying to recover a bit from is is that big impact that was being felt um, both by the economy and in terms of state subsidy. Mm. We're talking state revenue sharing has decreased right. um, probably almost by half, <coughs> not half. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah we're and only getting about 700000 now. So yeah. But the school's getting $4,259,000. million. That's last, last year. year. Yep. Last year. Yep. So it's not it's an insignificant amount. It's not an insignificant yeah. amount. I, I did the math on it because we were in the middle of a charter school conversation, which is a whole other meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it depending on how you parsed it, the state was giving us sort of 11 to 14 percent of our budget. operating budget. Right. So it's not insignificant. But you're right in, in that if we really want a long-range plan and we really want to know what we want to do in Scarborough and we're not looking over our shoulder to see what's happening somewhere else, then it makes sense to just sort of set that aside and say, this is what we want to build locally. The other thing is that the state has never fully funded education as they are required to by good old LD1. As much as we'd like them to. It's well, you know, that's the thing. If, if you could actually get them to pony up what they're really supposed to to the districts, would be good luck. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, I like your idea better. Yeah. Say bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. So um, I would like to just take a few minutes. Um, I do recognize that we have a few members in the public. Um, unless you <coughs> have anything real quick else that you would like to ask, um, I'm going to go ahead and open the floor to public comments. Can I just jump in with one yeah. thing? I know that um, Christine wanted to check in with you folks about some collaboration on meetings. Um, so I don't know at what point that would be appropriate to do. Okay. Maybe under general discussion. Is that general discussion? That's fine. We can. We can bump that real quick, that's fine. Um, we do have um, future meetings. I'm trying to think. We, uh, well, much like the school board's going to experience, have an election coming. Right. And um, I know for us, our committee assignments are usually handed out December. Um, so this is September as we speak. Um, we will not actually be meeting in October, but we do have a November meeting. Mm -hmm. um, certainly we could maybe touch base again at, at that time, and then December will really be at the hands of whoever's sitting in my chair. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> I, my only thought was that, you know, two years ago we discussed this in the budget process and we kind of started those conversations off, and then last year we started having those conversations, but they were a little bit too late to the game. 
So mm -hmm. we're kind of hoping that maybe we could start this I sooner well, yep. and maybe leave it and, and get some dates, maybe have the town manager, I know he's not here, so I'm kind of throwing him under the bus a little yeah. bit here, but <laughs> maybe have the town manager <laughs> work with the superintendent to I think um, work on some dates maybe. To to a very important piece that perhaps you have not had the luxury of is a liaison that will no offense to whoever is, but please tell me the last time you had a council liaison show up to your school board meeting. Mm -hmm. So perhaps um, with this next coming year that we make sure in our council appointments that it is somebody that is truly committed to that position and can be of a benefit and a use to you. Um, so I will be hunting and rooting around for that. It's a good, it's a good suggestion. Okay. And, um, Definitely, yeah. And certainly I think Absolutely. talking in terms of I don't think October is not meaningful. Uh, we're not going to meet. So wise. November, yeah. December, uh, having uh, our two lead administrators talk about possible dates, mm -hmm. and they in turn would be able to talk with you and Tom with yeah. Jessica. Sooner would make the better. Sense would so that we could maybe ha have discussions during the late, uh, early winter, late fall. Yeah. Well, I, th I think um, you know. I know that you're, you mentioned the. Um, the election, the kind of conversations that I think that the board is talking about and I know that I'm talking about um, are really process questions. I think that we have, um, none of us, the council or the, or the board or my team, quite frankly, have been served well by some of the process pieces that I think could be remedied pretty quickly, but that's going to require a, a conversation. And, um, you know, for example, uh, coming uh, coming out of the gates uh, with a number that is so conservative that it basically you know makes the flash in the news and then uh, and then people don't get to see that we've we've actually completely changed that number and I think it sets you all up and it sets the board up and, and the superintendent up to be um, in some ways unnecessarily criticized for you know, throwing something out there that's absurd. And, and so I think the timing of the process is really something that we need to look at. Um, I, I don't, uh, I don't th you know, again, uh, first year as the new superintendent, I follow the process that you have. Second year, I really questioned it. Third year, I'm asking that we change it um, because I don't think it serves us well. Um, and I think, um, you know, the other piece is really looking at a true joint workshop between the council and the school board where the public has an opportunity to really ask questions and have the questions answered um, from the town council perspective, but also from the school board perspective. So those are, I mean, those are a couple of the things as we debrief the process, we're seeing that those things are not really serving the interest of the council, the board, my team, or quite frankly, the community. And, and I think that that's, those are the kind of conversations that we are looking for, and that goes beyond who is elected or who's not elected. It's a process piece. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's, I think that's what, we're, mm -hmm. that's what we're throwing out there in terms of uh, getting together and sitting and having some of those conversations. And I think today was Yeah, it's, it's great. terrific. And I, you know, I was thinking about when uh, Jessica said, well, nobody's going to your meetings. Well, there was a... Saturday workshop, and I know that the Bill spent the whole day there, and so did Jean Marie, and I think Ed was there a part of the time. I think you were there a part of the time, or you? I know you've been to one of them, but it's like those kinds of opportunities where you really get to dig in and ask the questions, so that you don't come along later on and go, "Well, wait, when did that happen? What was yeah. that crazy thing?" So, I mean, not that we can all sit in each other's laps all day long, but it, I think there's room to to have a little bit more yeah. conversation earlier on. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, um, I wouldn't be opposed to having some participation in our, you know, annual goal setting. I'm certainly not opposed to, you know, an earlier workshop. I know our workshop usually tends to happen in process of budget. Um, so, you know, again, maybe a workshop, a header heading into budget, and then a workshop mm -hmm. as you come to the budget. You know, certainly makes some sense. Um, and then again, I think a good liaison that's really kind of you know communicating yeah. back and forth is a is a good good step too. Has the school board ever sent a liaison to the council? That's what, that's what I was asking ask. me. Um, usually, it's kind of 
it just in the, experience with what the committees that the I work with, it's the other way. Yeah. It's the one who then takes the and then word takes back that, to that the back, and then we report that. on you know what's going on in that committee initiatives. Um, there's also another great process that we're hoping that does kind of stick along, which is a workshop setting, um, perhaps maybe once a month prior to a council meeting to again just kind of hash out between councilors where everybody's at on a particular whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so th there are some workings and rumblings that are, are coming along the, along the pike to, to work on communication and, and broadening it and maybe having more opportunities. Mm -hmm. I will, when we talk about the data, I was just thinking you would still help ways that the data and I, I, I greatly appreciate what you're saying. I can't volunteer for that position personally at the moment, but um, I have enough, enough going on. <laughs> but, but certainly it, it would make a lot of sense that, um, and, and SEDCO was really great this year too in having joint workshops with committees themselves and bringing the committees together to speak to each other a little bit. And I think, again, that, that's a very beneficial thing that we're hoping to kind of continue with. So. Um, if there's no other questions, I'd like to just take a minute or two to open up to public comment if there's any, um, for any questions that the public might have. Nobody's popping up? Okay. All right then, well. So, um, and I, I agree with your comments about let's, let's look at the process so that the, the process and the timeline seem to work better so that we feel like we're on the same page in terms of communicating with each other. Right. I think that I think the, the certainly the finance committee would I really like would like the idea of let's let's understand before we're dealing with after the fact. Mm -hmm. Well, and Tom and I can can look. I mean, there's there are some specific recommendations um, that uh, that I've made to the board and that the board has discussed um, that they and the finance committee with the finance committee um, can can really take a look at. And, uh, and maybe Tom and I can facilitate that, those conversations. Yes. And, you know, not in this kind of setting, just around a table and, and really looking at the, at the timeline and, and what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you for, for your coming. time thank today. You. Thanks for coming down. That was great. Kate, you're very welcome. welcome. Kate wanted yeah, to. Yeah, I'm going to pull these back if y'all don't mind. <laughs> Ruth, do you want yours back as well? Nope. Okay. This is for August, so these are. Ruth, Ruth isn't a year end. I think they're on anyway.